Ele está no cartão. E ele está agora. Trust the DP to be looking at light at the very last minute. I love it. No, no, let me just check the light. Um, good evening, everybody. Welcome to today's Manyata Talks. I'm Hawa Esselman, and I am very pleased to be speaking with Drew Mungai and Kivu Ruhorahosa about looking for the story through picture, the camera's gaze. Welcome, guys. Thank you very much. I'm super, super pleased that you guys are here. Um, it's a conversation that I think, well, that I'm really interested to have, that I'm interested to share, just because it's a question that a lot of people have and they're very curious, but I think scared to really delve into or don't even know how to ask. So I'm going to attempt and we'll see where we'll go. Um, anyone who's joining us, thank you so much for tuning in. If you have any questions, please, please put them in the chat and we will do our best to get to them. My first question, of course, is um, to, for you guys to talk a little bit about your work, what brought you to your work? And most importantly, what is the, what's your idea? You know, like what, what sparks your idea? Do you know what I mean? Like, what's the thing that gets it going that makes you think that this is a good thing to actualize into an image? Drew, you go first. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, so why am I a cinematographer or director of photography? I, I think for me, I decided that I wanted to be behind the camera to when I was about 12 years old. I was a very active child. Uh, into sports. And I remember one day there was a television crew that came to film our football march in school. And I was very interested in, you know, the guys with the cameras and there was a, one of them was carrying a light and stuff like that. And it's my inquisitive nature that actually got me to kind of look behind the viewfinder. And of course we had a TV and I'd seen movies, but it kind of clicked how, you know, the, my fellow classmates were in this small little screen in this viewfinder. And it's like a bolt went on into my like, oh, okay, actually that sounds cool. Or that, that looks cool. So since then, I guess I kind of figured um, I wanted to be uh, in this business uh, or in this, in this field. And secondly, also I had a grandmother who used to tell a lot of very lively stories you know, around the campfire. And it was very visual. Her descriptions of, you know, those stories are very visual. And then growing up, I kind of, even right now, think back and I'm like, I haven't seen those visuals she was talking about. Like, I've, like I could see them in my brain, but I haven't seen them yet, you know? And these are, could be stories that about, you know, everyday life kind of things. And that was fascinating for me. So uh, growing up, even in high school, I joined the photography clubs. I, you know, I started taking pictures. And by the time I graduated from high school, I, I mean, I knew exactly what I was going to, to do. So um, I joined a school for broadcast television production. Um, I graduated, I became a trainer at the school, and then I started working as a freelance um, news and documentary cameraman, specifically uh, with international news organizations, Reuters, BBC, you know, Al Jazeera, all of them. And that just um, fascinated me because I was, you know, traveling, I was out, I was meeting people, you know, working on different stories. Um, I love watching films and storytelling in general, but specifically visually. And that's why I am a DP. Um, what fascinates me or what inspires me is everyday life. It could be sounds in the morning when you wake up, or it's a dream that you heard, or it's a, you know, just streak of light hitting a wall you know, those kind of things, or just a kid crying, or when I, you know, you want to find out what's happening, why, 
why is that happening that way? And so when I, whenever I get a project that I'm working on, I always go back to these memories of the things that I have seen um, and, uh, and try to recreate them or to kind of, you know, get inspiration from those kind of things, you know? Um, yeah, in a nutshell, that's, you know, that's what, that's what inspires me. But then also uh, being a, a cinematographer or a director of photography means that you have to work with writers, um, directors, uh, production designers, uh, people from other different fields, you know, right. uh, costume. Yeah, yeah. So, so they also bring something and you feed off from that. And that's where you get your ideas from. Um, yeah, um, my name is uh, Kivu Ruhorahosa, and uh, I'm uh, um, a filmmaker, director, um, occasional DP, um, and writer from Rwanda. And um, I came to uh, cinema um, uh, in 2000, and uh, um, I started working in film in 2004, uh, but as a production assistant and then as a production manager uh, and then uh, with um, a little bit of my uh, savings I started making my own short films uh, but my first um, uh, my, f my first uh, uh, encounter with uh, um, uh, uh, visuals that really had um, uh, that had an impact on me and wanted me to uh, create uh, things that were um, comparable in, in power. Uh, um, uh, it was in uh, first in 1996, I saw um, this film um, called uh, 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 In the Name of the Christ um, from Ivory Coast. It's a comedy um, that ridicules um, uh, Christian fundamentalist from West Africa. And uh, it, it was a film about this uh, guy who's a pig keeper in a small village, very poor village. And he's uh, the um, he's the lowest of the law in, uh, in uh, a, the uh, social hierarchy. And then this guy at some point decides that he's going to become, um, he's going to become a prophet and uh, he's going to become a cousin of the Christ uh, sent to save uh, the village from uh, uh, its turpitude. So he said uh, it's, um, but so the film was really beautiful and uh, it was set in this small uh, village with a beautiful river uh, flowing um, through the, uh, the village and then with tall uh, grass and beautiful, uh, beautiful sunlight and these uh, uh, gorgeous um, like skin tones, like really uh, dark skin tones that were uh, superbly filmed by this Algerian uh, DP. I uh, can't remember his name, but I think he lives in Switzerland. So that film really had an impact on me. It was my first time seeing um, something that was so uh, um, just the way people moved, and then the sounds, and then the uh, and then the language, the light, the, uh, the skin tones. It was something that had uh, an impact on me. And then a few uh, a few months later, I saw a French film called La Nuit. Um, and uh, uh, Lamy can translate um, to uh, the annoyance or the boredom. It's, uh, it's the same thing. And it's about a French philosopher who gets, um, who develops a, a, an obsession with, uh, with one of his students who's underage. Um, you know, the film was, uh, um, it's a drama, but it's also, um, it's a film that was, uh, that was very naturalistic in, in the way it was, uh, uh, it was filmed and uh, and I saw it and I was like, well, this looks um, this looks like uh, the the visuals I see uh, on uh, TV Cinq Monde or France Two, uh, but they are used in such a um, in such an efficient way that they make me uh, 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 they, they make me um, feel. Um, uh, they, they feel that I'm in the room with these characters. They were just so compelling in, in, in their simplicity. They were so uh, efficient in the way they uh, they were uh, framed and lit and and uh, the camera movements. And it's another film that kind of um, really made me want to um, to get involved with uh, uh, with images. Uh, and then years later, um, I was trying to get hired on a, on a film by um, the guy who hired me first. Uh, but I was under and he didn't uh, he didn't hire me and I went back to him five years later and he hired me as a production assistant and years later now I'm I'm here working as a director about to shoot 
for myself and I shoot for others. I've, uh, felt I've now grown to be comfortable enough to shoot for other uh, directors, um, which which I love, um, and uh, I hope to uh, to one day um, uh, feel comfortable enough to call myself a cinematographer. But yeah, and then so what? Uh, what kind of uh, um, uh, what awakens my um, my inspiration, or what awakens my, what 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 triggers my um, wanting to grab a camera and shoot immediately, or plan to shoot uh, something uh, in the, in the future or the near future, as Drew was saying, some it's it's these um, moments of uh, moments of everyday life, uh, light uh, filtered through the uh, the uh, the curtains. Um, Sometimes it's the the, the, the shoulders of a, of a, of a nun of, a, of a, a passerby on the street moving in a way that kind of I just oh I wish I could capture I could have captured that or I wish I I, I want to reproduce that uh, uh, body movement uh, across the space uh, uh, or it's um, it's uh, it's somebody running on the street it's uh, um, it's uh, the uh, the leaves of a tree uh, uh, like dancing to the wind so it, it can be any it can be anything and 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 it's um, and with experience and uh, and with passion comes this uh, um, ability I guess to to, uh, to to notice or to be alert to uh, um, uh, to possible uh, moments of uh, of visual poetry, if I if I may, yeah, yeah, I definitely understand that. But then, okay, so let me ask you: Were you both then just I want to be the creator of perfect images, zygotes? You know, were you just born and poof out of thin air? You, as if by magic, you then just create images that are compelling or that you can stand by. I imagine not, no? I mean, I think as a director, some of the stuff that I made at the beginning, I thought, oh my God, what I wanted and what, is, and what I have are miles apart. Um, how did you, I guess, what did your first work look like? You know, when you picked up the camera and you were looking for this and you were looking for the image and you looked through the camera, what was that like? And you shot something and you thought you had it. Did you have it or did you feel like it needed work? And how did you sort of chip away at what didn't work? Or maybe, you know, it all just worked out perfectly. I don't know. I'm assuming not because we're human. Is that fair to assess? Is that fair to say? Well, um, uh, can I go first, Drew? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Yeah. So, so many, so many times I have, uh, um, uh, uh, found myself doing things that I found absolutely gorgeous and I was proud of myself that oh I'm growing as a as a as a cinematographer and they they really didn't work for, for the story or for the project and then and, and I had to uh I had to put them in a folder to be used in the future or to be uh marveled at for myself uh, so the the uh, for me the rule number one is to create um visuals that serve the story the story is uh, is everything uh, and if uh, um, if I'm working for my for myself, and sometimes I have to um, to try and uh, and step out of my um, role as a, as my own cinematographer, and then see myself as a, as a director who uh, whose um, first priority is a story, and then everything else has to serve the story. All the energies and all the creative. Um, uh, abilities and all the creative uh, uh, intuitions uh, have to be uh, like uh, driven towards uh, serving the story and uh, making sure that the story is well served. And sometimes this story is served by something that's not um, uh, that's not um, necessarily gorgeous and uh, and uh, and and marvelous and and uh, eth ethereal. So I think the important thing is to create visuals that don't. Uh, uh, need to stand out uh, on their own. Uh, there has to be a perfect balance, and, and the story has to be uh, a top, and then everything else has to come inside the story. Yeah, I agree with you 100% on that one. Um, I mean, now I've been doing this for 20 years. Uh, of course, when I was younger, you, you, you know, you, you grow up thinking that you know, you want a cinematographer is somebody or a director of photography is somebody who, who makes stunning images 
but stunning images on their own are just stunning images but what's the story behind it a story is a, the thing that drives us forward and every story has characters and you know as you grow older you, you or you become a filmmaker you understand that especially for directors of photography we're very technical in one side but also we have to be creative you have to understand what is the story and then who are the characters driving that story why are they going wherever they're going or where are they coming from and then how do you use your technical capabilities because as a cinematographer you need to have those technical capabilities to actually move that story forward as Kiva was saying so it's it's quite a balance of of, of using your technical skills um to serve the story and to serve the vision of the director kivu is uh, kivu is a director himself i call myself a cinematographer and director of photography i don't direct the actors or the characters but you know depending on the kind of film that you're making even a house and you know the geography of a place is a character in itself how do you treat that um so as a cinematographer you know especially a narrative narrative cinematographer um which is different from news and documentary a narrative cinematographer you have to understand that the story is key and that's number one it's not about making stunning images there are people who are very technically proficient in making stunning images but they're not good storytellers because if you don't understand if you don't read the script if you don't break it down if you don't know who's who's doing what where why and where are they going and how do you move an audience with with that then you know because if 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 i watch a movie and all i'm seeing is stunning visual but i'm not getting the story i'm lost and i can watch a film which has you know pedestrian visuals but the story is very interesting and 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 i'm sold and i can i can watch it and i enjoy it so I think that's 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 very key for 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 people to understand, especially for me. I understand that um, the visuals have to serve the story. So then, let me ask you, just to to go back to what you said, Drew, um, as as someone who has shot narrative and documentary and news mm -hmm. as well, where do Correct. they meet? Where do they meet? Because they meet somewhere. There's there's some tenets for which all it's true for all of them. So yeah, true, true. I think uh, I guess for me the difference that I saw because I started out as a news documentary uh, as a news slash documentary film uh, and then went going into narrative is that for uh, for for news you have to be objective in the way you see things like when i'm filming a scene i'm not going to i'm going to frame it or i'm going to use the camera as a tool to tell the story of the people from an objective perspective with narrative you're telling the story of the people from a point of view that you've already discussed before or you 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 know about from the writer or from you know from the script you know whatever the script is but in 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 news you have to stay objective because they are like you know those are real things about real people and you know you are not supposed to put your own input as the news person you are supposed to tell it to the audience and then the audience will probably figure it out right um so we were at least there we are start is like you have to be very aware of not putting your own insinuations into the story and that affected how you film it but with narrative you have all the creative freedom to do whatever you want because that's a fiction it's a fictional story with news it wasn't fiction that was real life and you had to make choices and those choices could have life and death consequences and i saw that myself so i think that was for me the big uh difference between shooting news for television like you know you shoot news and it up you know seven o'clock people will watch the news and you had to be you know and narrative where you decide to place the camera is very different when you're shooting news and and, and fictional story 
you know so it was the non-fiction and the fictional aspect for me that was the key and when i went into narrative filmmaking making i was like oh my gosh you can decide to film somebody from this camera angle and they will look bad if you do that in news perceptually you're making that person look bad but you don't understand why and that can have a consequence on on the audience you know so i think for me that visually that those are some of the things that differentiate fiction and non-fiction okay thank you i don't know if that, make, I don't know if that makes sense it does it does um would you have anything to add no well maybe later but yeah but those that, that for me was a difference so when i when i went into fictional film uh filmmaking you know to I started out as an assistant on commercials and and things like that i was like oh wow you can do that you can have several takes in news you don't have several takes that was the only take you know why five takes of the same thing with a script or oh, let's change the line no the interview that you do with whoever is concerned about you know maybe they don't have food or you know maybe there was whatever it is that was it you don't have a second take and you better make sure you got it the first time you can't ask them again can you repeat what you said because no. you miss the emotion right. or you miss the story whatever that story is with fiction you yeah okay can we repeat that again or yeah, can there's, I... there's emotion there too no I mean, yes there's emotion but you there is emotion but it's always you have to get it the first time okay you know you can't ask somebody to you know for whatever reason or maybe you should do, do it this way no at least in my training that wasn't mm. ideal that was 20 odd years ago so maybe you things think change has changed since then really you think school has changed i doubt that Kivu, do you have anything um, to add um i um i, I like the uh, uh the simplicity uh or the um lack of pretense of uh, um uh, of of fiction to say look we're going to we're not going to be uh, um uh we're not going to be filming people in their natural uh like environments doing natural things because the moment the camera appears uh people tend to uh perform uh, even in real life, and uh, and the way uh, and the way we we frame uh, the way we frame uh, faces, bodies, spaces, um, crowds uh, is uh, is always um, there's a, um, in, in my opinion there's a, uh, an amount of uh, um, unconscious um, narrative in it, depending uh, because of the uh, biases that we have and that we are not always aware of uh, I, the way um, uh, a guy from Wisconsin is going to come and film um, uh, you know, um, in, in the south of Rwanda is not going to be the same way uh, a, a guy from the region from Kenya or from Rwanda is going to film it and the uh, um, I like the fact that um, the news producing and, and, and news um, uh, the, I mean, the, the way we collect uh, images that end up being edited, which is a sort of a, a fictional rewriting as well, uh, the, way, the way these things are changing. So, um, uh, yeah, so th that's why I feel very comfortable when I'm uh, when I'm on a, uh, on, on, a, on a narrative set on a fiction film set because I know that we're not pretending to uh, to, uh, to be. Uh, uh, to be riding high horses and being on high moral grounds and and uh, and like showing the world and being this uh, all powerful news correspondents and then sending Im uh, our images to uh to uh newsrooms to western capitals to, uh, to rewrite uh, by just passing here and then uh, i missed my part of the story yeah so that i, I yeah i felt that um the news um, producing uh, news, uh, filming for, uh, um, uh, for uh, media, uh, uh, filming media that goes to uh, um, uh, that goes to, uh, to, to uh, editors that package it for uh, news consumers. It's, it sounds to me like a sacred mission, and then I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't dare. Uh, the, uh, going for example to Yemen, 
uh, and then filming the war there and then uh, and then producing images uh, that I'm not going to have any um, uh, any control over and then uh, and, and thinking that I produce um, uh, non-fiction yeah so that's why I feel much more comfortable I feel safer and then I maybe it's ca it's cowardice but I feel safer and um, uh, on a set where we are uh, just um, uh, like being very um, uh, very uh, focused on, uh, on 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 admitting that we are uh, we are recreating, uh, we are performing, and yeah, because the moment the camera appears, uh, really people just the moment uh, even uh, even um, populations in Western countries are so used to the presence of cameras, but the moment the camera appears, somebody's going, for example, to um, perform indifference, and I look, uh, you're filming something, and then I haven't noticed you. I just I just walk past. While in uh, in Kigali, if I, if I take uh, even a small camera and go on the street, and somebody's just going to come in, there, hey, please don't film me. While they while there's so much space for them to uh, yeah uh, to avoid your camera, or they'll stop by and then look in the camera, or they just yeah. So people really the ca the camera is a is a thing that just uh, creates uh, that triggers performance. In, yeah. yeah. And and I agree with you uh, on that one because I I want to say I was spent about five six years as a news well maybe even more than that as a strict news and uh, news cameraman and it reached a point where I was up to here and I had to look for other ways of still being behind the camera and and I went back to what I said earlier about storytelling my my grandmother and the stories that she used to tell me or when I was a kid watching Mahabharat and Ramayan and those fascinating um, Indian stuff. And I was like, how come we don't have this here? Okay, you know, so that's why I had to say go into narrative filmmaking because that to me was more important than mm -hmm. watching uh, CNN and Al Jazeera and all those people who I was working for because I, yes, I was working for them and I was making those pictures, but I felt so disconnected. I was like, why this this what what stories am I am I helping to build here? I mean, this is it's it's insane. So and and for me, I was like, okay, I'm done with this, right? And so I was looking for ways to kind of segue from that kind of storytelling into the things that really I was interested in watching when I was a kid, you know, and 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 that's where that's where I am right now. But having said that, I think the news side gave me a lot of um, things to pick up on, which I still use until today. It's, it was a good training ground for, for, for being a, a fictional storyteller. I'm really glad that you brought that up because there is a question that's asking you, Drew, if documenting made you more efficient and tight when working on narrative, or did it block the creative juice? Because I, this person feels like shooting on the continent, you never have enough time. You never have you never have enough time anyway, whether you're shooting fiction or fiction, right? I don't think time is one of those things where you, you never had enough time. Uh, what I can say is that the resources for uh, for for news at the time, um, I started out when it was it was still a big deal. You know, we had the big beta cams and and and, and analog cameras and things like that, and then we segued into the PT 170s and the PT 150s was a digital revolution. Everything became became smaller, and the crews were, you know, we used to go six people, and then we started going three people, and then all of a sudden it was one person doing everything. Uh, I remember the times when we were editing on huge machines, you know, tape to tape, no laptops or anything. I mean, I remember a nine gigabyte hard drive was this big, you know. But what that did is that it you had to be very astute with what you're trying to say and when you're going to say and how to do it you know so yeah. um it that was a good training ground for that uh and mm -hmm. and you had cameras that was so slow in terms of iso i mean it was like a 50 at 6 30 p.m you couldn't shoot anymore because there was no light well right. i mean there was light but the camera could not record not that yeah it wasn't enough so you had to time yourself and know exactly what your what your story is how you're going to tell it how much equipment you're going to carry. Um, so all of those things, and it compressed time and it, it you just became efficient. Yeah. And and, and 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 by the way, you had a 
a, a deadline. You had to send your story by a certain time. So it goes on air because the news broadcast is at 7 p.m. in the States or whatever, you know. So that kind of worked on your timing. Um, so it was good for that. Um, and the speed of things, it was very fast. I mean, the turnaround was so quick. So, and, and you had to be creative into, in, in making some of those decisions, which I still use until today. Um, and then when the things became smaller now, again, you know, one person was doing everything. So I, I did, I shot, I did sound, I edited, I sent the files via FTP to wherever they were going. You know, so what that what that does, it helps me understand who, what does a sound person do? What, what is good sound? What is not good sound? And then actually I was taught sound is 70% of the picture in those right. days. You know, you can have beautiful images, but without sound, you, you, you're not creating that story, right? Mm -hmm. You can have a great looking interview, but if your sound sucks, then too bad. You can't create that sound. So you had to make sure that other departments got their stuff in order, sound. Um, editing. So whenever you're shooting, you have to think of the edit. You have to think about how much, what is your shooting ratio, because they give you one tape and you have to tell the story in that one tape. You don't have to, nowadays we're doing it digital, just keep the camera running. You, you know, so those, those kind of things were very helpful as a, as a, as a fictional storyteller. And I okay. still use, use some of that stuff. Okay. It was good training ground. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, Kivu, what would you say? Because I know that you've worked in both documentary and fiction. So do they feed off of each other? Like what harnessed did documentary sort of tighten your, make you more efficient? And did fiction allow bring anything that you then introduced into your doc work? Well, what, um, what Drew said about, um, I mean, the discipline, uh, the, um, the uh, number of hours that you have to shoot something, when you have to deliver it, the amount of media that you have uh, for storage, and all that. Um, it's a reality that I, uh, when shooting on the continent, that I, uh, I face. But, um, but it's because uh, sometimes we don't live in cities where you can, um, where you can have access to uh, a really good drive, uh, and that's large enough. And then sometimes you find yourself uh, disciplining your uh, your camera crew because you know that you can't shoot uh, uh, you can shoot uh, the, uh, seven hours a day or five hours a day because you just you you, you can't uh, manage that that amount of data because you we we don't have uh, we don't have access to good drive to good drives and uh, to uh, uh, good equipment you can't always rent unfortunately in mo in most. Uh, parts of Africa, but the the uh, but sometimes working on documentaries um, because I worked as an assistant um, uh, in wildlife and uh, nature uh, documentaries, and uh, the um, because they were so well funded uh, at that time, um, I was a bit um, uh, I, I was uh, I got the wrong uh, like a wrong type of. Uh, um, I got a wrong type of uh, feel over what uh, a, a, a true yeah. uh, documentary um, uh, is in, in its making um, like aspects, and so so we, we, yeah, we'll be hiring helicopters to to shoot um, something that we're not even sure that's going to end up uh, in 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 the fifteen um, minute documentary for Animal Planet, and then yeah. And then there was the financial crisis in 2008, and uh, um, crews got smaller. And then, uh, the, uh, as Drew was saying, uh, the PD-150 and PD-170s became popular. And then uh, we had the EX-1s, and then uh, the, yeah, and then crews got smaller. And then I started realizing that, um, OK, if you're doing so much uh, on a set, on a documentary set, you have to be uh, ultra vigilant of things that are going around. And then you have to be uh, uh, super um, like meticulous with uh, all these things. I mean, you have your uh, viewfinder, and you have all these uh, uh, you have all this information, all these meters, and you have to make sure that uh, you're not screwing up with uh, with this. And then you have to make sure that the sound is not clicking, and then you have to make sure that uh, what you think the camera is going the way uh, it should be going. And then you have to be aware of the surroundings. 
because there might there might be something really important happening that you're not going to catch. So you have to uh, uh, to be basically super alert uh, to everything that's what's happening in the camera in terms of image and sound and and then your characters and then the environment and then uh, the hours because. Uh, even when you're not uh, responsible uh, for the budget by you, any responsible filmmaker, any crew member should be um, aware of the budget and be aware. Of, and that's how you become a responsible um, storyteller. You have to be uh, conscious of the, of the budget realities. So the, um, I mean, these realities, me coming, um, coming of age when uh, there was a financial, the financial crisis, uh, budget cuts uh, uh, like all around the world, and uh, uh, and then uh, but but that um, coming of age uh, coincided as, uh, coincided as well with uh, um, manufacturers putting out there uh, lots of equipment. Uh, so he, so I have no excuse um, to uh, I have no excuse. The uh, what I learned working on uh, with uh, TV crews that are producing documentaries. And uh, I used it. Um, uh, I used it because uh, I had access to equipment, uh, to these uh, miniaturized equipment that got more and more accessible. And uh, uh, and 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 that discipline from um, like uh, documentary crews that were slimming down and they were getting poorer and poorer has helped me uh, uh, understand that. Um, uh, the, every project is like a small, um, it's like a small uh, business uh, project, and it has to be uh, run efficiently. And then uh, most of the time, us being um, uh, technicians and, and artists from countries, uh, uh, we we don't have um, enough opportunities. You only get one or two chances, as in like every opportunity to go out there. Every opportunity to lay your hands on, on equipment and every opportunity to be uh, um, trusted with the responsibility of telling somebody's story. I mean, it just makes you, uh, uh, at least it makes me uh, super kind of uh, uh, like nervous, as in like I'm in front of people trusting me with their stories. Uh, I can't, uh, I have the responsibility of filming them the way they wish they would be filmed. Uh, I or at least I have the responsibility of, of not. Um, uh, of my biases, not uh, 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 being, uh, no, not um, reflecting poorly on them, and then uh, yeah. So it's it's these. Uh, it's it's a it's a really good school to um, when it comes to being disciplined, and then when it comes to um, uh, knowing how to deal with humans and 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 I've yeah, I've learned a lot working on documentaries, and and uh, it helps me. Um, being on, on film sets and knowing how to um, uh, to be careful to not lose your characters the way you do it in documentaries because if a character kind of uh, just uh, like you have a project with them for four months and then uh, you piece them off by the uh, third or uh, by the second week and then they've uh, um, been part of your project so much and you can't afford to lose them. It's the same way on a, on a, on a narrative project where you, a, a key crew member in a country where you only have two focus pullers or where you ho you only have uh, one gaffer that you felt that you can work with, you can't lose them. And then, yeah, so it's all these like politics, uh, human behavior, the psychology, the, um, the, uh, uh, the, the necessity uh, to be uh, a decent human and then to be uh, um, as much a good professional as you can be. So th that I learned a lot of it from uh, um, documentary uh, productions as well. Okay. So then my question to both of you is, in the midst of all of the pressures and the considerations that you have to have in the environment that you're working and with the time crunch, how do you know that you have it? How do you know that once you've if someone has yelled cut or the day is over, how do you know that you have something that works? Well, I think for me, it comes from the many years that I've worked where you know, and, and, and because of my experience now, I, I've, I, I've come to know that sometimes less is more. You know, when I was younger, maybe we used to shoot a lot because Maybe I wasn't comfortable, not, not comfortable, but I wasn't sure that we got it, you know? So I had to cover my bases. Uh, if we're shooting a scene, I would shoot four wide shots and 
20 medium shots, 10 medium shots and 15 close-ups, you know, to, to make that scene work so that when you go to the edit, you've got it. Now, you don't need all of that because, you know, you, with experience, you get to know that you, you've, got, you've got the moment or you've got what you need. Um, I think, for me, it's a gut feeling. Um, it's a gut feeling when I know, okay, I got, I got the moment. And sometimes I can I, I tell my director, he's like, okay. And then, like the other day, we were shooting a music video. I said, can we do one more? I, we do one more because, because now we are in fictional mode. Uh, I have a camera that's connected to a wireless focus machine, and somebody else is pulling the focus. And I feel like he buzzed a bit in a very key moment. And then the director is happy with it. But I'm like, can we just do one more? Because I don't know in the edit, you know, I'm looking at a small monitor. If this is going to go big, who knows what the focus is going to look like? So yes, we got the moment in with the character, but technically there was a bit of a of a buzz or a fuzz or something. So I, my gut instinct was, can we do one more? The musician was like, fine, let's do one more. And director was like, easy, let's do it. So it's one of those things where you kind of figure you, you, your gut feeling tells you. So it's practice. It's yeah. It's it's practice. Yes. Would you yeah. agree? Uh, yes, practice. Um, yeah, practice experience is uh, is, is um, quite often it's everything in uh, in our work. Um, so there's the gut feeling uh, for me as well, but there's also the um, uh, the uh, a priority list. Uh, um, like well, when I, when I go to shoot um, something and I know that this is essential, this uh, I, I, I must uh, go back home with it, uh, and then it, uh, it has to be uh, um, technically perfect and it has to serve the story, and uh, uh, and then when when I get that, it gives me uh, um, much more. Uh, it gives me room for uh, uh, self bonuses. It gives me room for uh, for. Uh, uh, being a little more intuitive, it liberates me on set. And uh, um, but the thing sometimes um, uh, because um, I'm, I'm a young cinematographer, and most of the time I've worked for myself. Uh, I, I I sometimes work for other directors, so I'm quite sweating to be honest when I'm working for other people because I'm just scared that I'm going to uh, I'm, I'm not going to get it uh, the way they wish uh, uh, they wish it happened. Um, so the there's uh, the, um, the the essential and then uh, the accessory, the bonus, and uh, um, uh, and then when I feel that uh, when I feel that I have achieved that I have, I have achieved that I have the uh, the sh uh, shot that I wanted, and when I feel that I have given myself uh, a, a little bonus to make myself happy, and uh, if we have if the the time allows it, and if the uh, if the resources allow it, sometimes I'll even go ahead and ask uh, the people in front of the camera, as in, uh, like, do you feel that you give me uh, uh, your um, uh, your best uh, performance, or, or do you feel that there's uh, something that um, that still in you uh, that could be um, uh, that could elevate my camera work? Because sometimes I could, I could do something really good, but the uh, but at the end of the day, it's a it's a Bit of choreography with the people in front of the camera, and then uh, some of the actors who are so um, uh, who are so comfortable and so experienced and who know how to uh, like waltz with the camera, and then uh, um, and then if they if you don't give them uh, if I don't give them the opportunity to um, sometimes to uh, to help me do my job. Uh, then maybe I'm losing an opportunity to uh, yeah to do uh, an extra take that could be uh, the one that ends up uh, being used yeah so it's, uh, it's the gut instinct it's uh, uh, me uh, um, uh, choosing to be uh, very kind of uh, uh, I mean understanding where I am in, uh, at this moment in my career as a cinematographer as as a director I feel I feel comfortable uh, but as a cinematographer I just have to make sure that I've got that uh, thing that I. I can put out there and feel comfortable with it. Uh, okay. I shot the film in 2015, and and I hate seeing it now because uh, uh, because it's just uh, yeah. But again, the story I think was uh, strong enough to, to and then he, he he made the film uh, go out there, and he, he, the story uh, helped the film. 
go out there, have a career. Uh, but the, but the, the, the cinematography is just, uh, yeah, it's embarrassing. And yeah, and it's because I was not, um, I was not experienced enough. And then sometimes I was uh, um, trusting my guts while I wasn't, um, uh, while I should have uh, um, had a different strategy. Maybe in five years I'll be, uh, yeah. And now I understand more the equipment and then I understand more uh, uh, my strength and uh, my strengths and weaknesses as a, uh, as an image technician, so I can trust my gut a little more, but I also have to make sure that uh, this is what we set out to do today, and then this we absolutely have to get. Yeah. Okay. So a question to both of you. Um, you've both touched on this. So it, um, I'm curious about the question of trust, and I mean self-trust, that you know that you have it, but also the trust of the people that you're working with that serves the image and the story. How do you a cultivate that, and how do you you know flex that? Because sometimes you have to really call on that trust that could potentially break it. Because so how do you cultivate internal trust to know a you've got it? We've talked about that a little bit, but also how you cultivate generate trust within the team to get the best image and to get the best aspect of the story that you're trying to get in that moment? Mm. Well, for, for me, it's, uh, um, uh, the, uh, uh, doing uh, my homework uh, and understanding how the equipment works and then, uh, and then um, doing my best to understand how uh, uh, a gaffer works so that I can improve my communication with them understand uh, a little bit of the elect uh, uh, electric uh, electrical department understanding um, how people work so that I can um, uh, create the, uh, um, the the communication uh, that is most efficient for us to be able to deliver and and uh, yeah so w when I've done the homework and when I'm sitting with a camera and I really really know how that uh, camera on a purely technical level, how the camera works, how the lenses work, how, uh, yeah, what are the meters and then what are the uh, limitations of this camera? Uh, how does this camera perform in this kind of environment? And then uh, me uh, making sure that I understand the story so well. I've read, this, uh, I've read the script, I've uh, read the character's biographies, I've looked at the uh, backstories, I've looked at what's been uh, done that is of, uh, um, uh, that, that, that could be uh, comparable. And then when I understand that I'm working with, uh, um, I'm working with, uh, uh, with, with the right crew that I have chosen, and uh, uh, it makes me, uh, it, it helps me uh, trust myself because I now know the technical tools that I have at my disposal and I have done my homework. I know, uh, I know myself, I've done a sort of a, like, it's like a SWOT analysis. I've looked at my strengths and weaknesses and the opportunities and the threats, just like a, a consultant would do uh, with a project. And uh, so I know my equipment, I know myself, I know where I am, uh, I'm at in my career. And uh, I know that I've developed um, uh, the right communication tools with uh, uh, my department and with, uh, with my collaborators. Uh, and over time, that trust gets built. Uh, and it's uh, the way you see them uh, performing under uh, pressure and then how you communicate to them. Uh, under pressure, it's how you uh, communicate to them uh, fresher ideas that were not uh, on the short list. It's the way you uh, um, uh, kind of uh, uh, help them help yourself, or how you uh, when they they are uh, they are uh, messing up a short, how you communicate to them to uh, um, fix things. Uh, it's it's really all about communication because uh, if you if your communication is uh, uh, tends to uh, dismiss their work or uh, not kind of empower them or, uh, or not uh, be aware of the efforts uh, that they've put into uh, um, like a setup or uh, you not understanding their own limitations uh, when it comes to the equipment that they have at their disposal or the weather or uh, then you just you just ruining um, uh, this relationship with, with your team yeah so me uh, having done my homework helps me trust myself 
uh, and me understanding uh, this is um, this is the right environment to shoot this uh, uh, this way. This is the right tools to uh, uh, shoot this and serve the story. And then me uh, um, uh, doing um, a lot of work on my communication, uh, my communication with my team helps me trust them. And then after the project, or even in the, uh, uh, in the first days of the project, if I feel that, if I feel, because again, we're humans, if I feel that um, this relationship is meant to break, and then uh, we, I cannot trust these people with, uh, um, uh, with being uh, uh, vigilant enough, uh, thorough enough, meticulous enough, uh, then I just uh, I just let it go, and yeah, sometimes yeah, I go with my feelings, and then I'm like, this this is not worth uh, investing in. As yeah, right now I'm working with a gaffer, and then uh, we worked with uh, I worked with them uh, all of 2020. We worked on so many small projects, and now we uh, we're shooting a feature together. And then I understand him. I, I know the I know his equipment, and I know his uh, uh, CV. I know uh, our background. I know where our industry is at the moment. I know how uh, meticulous he is, and then uh, yeah, and so I know how to communicate to him. I know uh, how to get what I need to get from him, and I know um, I know now that I can trust him. And then it's uh, yeah, it's relationship building, and it takes time, and it takes uh, a little bit of a strategy. Yeah, all the feelings are involved, but a little bit of strategy to yeah. Yeah, Ruth. Yeah. Yeah, uh, more or less the same what, uh, sorry, just getting a phone call here. I'm going to silence my phone. Um, what Kiva has talked about is actually just the same process. Uh, for me, I usually start with the director. I get hired by a director or a producer. And, and you create a, a relationship with them. And through that, you, you talk about what the story is, um, how you're going to approach it, and be, that's between the director producer and then from then once you understand what the story is and you read the script um i still have a thing here locally i find that people who call themselves directors of photography or cinematographers who don't read a script they may have a camera but they don't read the script to know what the story is that means then what are you going off of besides the conversation that you've had with your director because when you read the script that's your that's where you get your inspiration from because that's where you have to bring something. I mean, it's a symbiotic relationship. The director has a vision, but you also bring your vision and you marry it together. Of course, it's always the director's story, but my job as a director of photography is to understand what the director wants so I can be able to help them. When you have that collaborative effort, then you can proceed to hire the crew whom you have a relationship with. Luckily for me, I've reached a point where I am very, very well aware of all the crew that are in Kenya. I have worked with all of them. We have established a relationship. They know how I work and I have taught them or they have seen how we work on a project. So I will explain to them what the story is. Uh, we will go on a recce or location scout. But before we go on the location scout, I'll tell them what the story is so that we are all aware. What are the, what is the story? Where is it going? Is this location great or it's not great? Or, you know, together as a team. The reason I do that is so that the director focuses on the vision and I focus on the technical side of it and the, the creative and technical side of, of, of making the film. So the director doesn't have to worry about that. My job is to be the lieutenant to the director so that they focus on the story with the characters. I take care of all the other technical stuff and the crewing. When you work like that, you create trust among each other. I trust my gaffer. Um, he knows more than I do, you know, in terms of I may have the visions of what kind of light we are, we're going to use or blah, 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 but I leave it up to him because he's an expert in his business, right? The grip guy is an expert in his business. The VFX person is an expert in his. So you hire the right people who 
obviously you have to check them out first but luckily for me i've worked since i came back 2000, 2016 you know we all know each other now we've gotten to a place where it's shorthand you know if i get a job i'll call such and such a guy and such and such a guy depending on the complexity and budget and 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 what so that's how you create trust when i get on set and i see a face I, ah hey how are you man you know it's easy you know and we have that shorthand because we know each other we've worked together i don't think there's a new person who works in the technical team in camera grip electric that i don't know in kenya but what if you, you know, don't know them? because you know them now you know them now right but what if okay. at the beginning so well, you don't. And, and that's why i said it, it it you go back for example like next week we're going to shoot a, a commercial in ethiopia the last time i was in ethiopia was years ago so we have to get new people that we're going to work with but we have been working on this project uh pre-production for the last two weeks we understand what it is what are the complications what is the issue issues that you know whatever and we have to go hire people in ethiopia right so i'm gonna have to sit down with the guys that i hire and explain to them like they're six-year-old children this is what we're trying to do and this is how we plan to do them is it okay and it's not me telling them it is sharing ideas and saying okay what are the issues what how can we do this better i want them to feel part of the of the production not me saying this is what i want to do here now no it's like you know help me out here let's make this let's do this together you know, right. I like to hear their opinions, not just my opinion. In fact, more often than not, when you give them the chance to speak up and tell you, you learn more about the environment and yourself, and that's better for the production. You know, so yeah, that's how I approach it. Hmm. What well, I also do is uh, when it's uh, um, uh, coll collaborators, uh, future collaborators, or, or people that I intend to work with for. Uh, um, um in the future i uh, I, I do a lot of um, a lot of research on them because uh, uh, unfortunately our work is very expensive uh and sometimes it's really expensive how, um how a, a small project really a basic documentary yeah. can cost uh, 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 enough money to build a small uh, clinic and in, in that's that's <laughs> the reality yeah. yeah our work is so expensive mm. Uh, uh, and then most of the time, uh, as Drew was saying, we uh, there's never enough time. Yeah, we don't we don't get uh, enough time to uh, do what we uh, we wish we could do. And then so it's important to research on the people that um, I'm about to work with. And uh, um, and weeks in advance, I invite them for uh, a coffee, for drink. Uh, kind of ask them ask them questions about uh, what they want to work with me, where are they seeing themselves, what kind of films do they watch. And sometimes it's people that I have a very little in common with, but they are solid. They want to do a good job, they're professionals, they want to deliver, and then they cannot afford, because these industries are quite small and they're quite incestuous in East Africa. They don't, they cannot afford to, uh, to not be... Uh, um, are serious on their job because you easily get uh, it's natural selection. Very few people survive um, two years of uh, of messing around. So it's a uh, it's um, like really doing research, interviewing people, uh, socializing with them, and seeing how they uh, they're going to be treating the waiters or how they're going to be how they talk about uh, the previous directors they work with or how they talk about the previous cinematographers. Cinematographers with are they humble? Are they are they team players? Are they? Uh, it's because uh, things get quite um, tense and poisonous very quickly, and uh, and our work is very expensive, and we never have enough time. So, okay. I there's a question from from uh, someone over here saying, "Hey, wondering more, wondering more about conversations with the director leading up to the shoot. What kind of questions are you asking to get to the layers beneath what is on the page?" and how much prep time is ideal? And a cheap second question, uh, what sort of references, um, what are your references that you love so much and keep coming back to over the years? Uh, you go, Drew. Uh, I'll, I'll answer the second question after, yeah. Okay, okay. so conversations with the director. I th uh, that's for me the key. Um, you have to know who the director is, 
uh, you have to set aside time for you guys to just discuss amongst yourselves what the project is about, how they envision it, why did they hire me, or, or why do I want to work on this project? Uh, because I believe uh, it's a symbiotic relationship. I mean, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's, the exchange of ideas is what makes the project um, through. So I, we like to, I like to thrash it, to hear first from what the director wants to, to do, um, to look at the scope of the work, uh, sometimes you, from 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 a director's DOP's perspective, um, I I don't like to say no. I usually never say no, um, in terms of the scope of a project because I'm like, oh my gosh, how am I going to do that? Um, it's 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 if there's something that I don't understand, you just keep asking questions until you understand it. And what are the where is it coming from? Um, and how do you do that? And um, yeah, and and you have to just ask questions until you get you get what the director wants to to do and to say. Once you do that, then um, of course you've read the script, or you you know you look at it and you're like, okay, is this possible? And if it's not possible, what? Why is it not possible? And how, how can you do it differently? I always feel like you have. I have to have. And that's why I'm saying no is not an option for me. But it's like okay, maybe this way is it's not the easiest. Not easiest, but it's not the ideal way to do it. How can, how about if we do it this way, right? right? And you exchange those kind of ideas, and 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 you 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 reach a point where you you feel okay, maybe this is right, or maybe this is not right. Like Kivu said, sometimes you don't have to take the project. I've turned down some projects because I'm like, okay, you know what? I don't feel right about it. You right. know, uh, if I have nothing to offer, then I'll just be a, a a guy just doing the thing without bringing anything into it. I would hate to be in a situation where I'm just doing something and I don't understand why or I don't know what my input in this thing is. Um, so I think I think that's for me is key. So in okay. terms of inspirations, um, I like to watch a lot of stuff. I mean, whether it's films, whether it's um, listening to music and, and, and things like that. And I, I, every time I see something interesting, uh, where you go watch a music video on YouTube and stuff, you see something interesting, I take images and I have a, a, a flood of folders of inspirations of images and things that inspire me you know and i put them aside so when i'm reading a script and i'm like ah you know maybe this scene because the way it's written feels like what, what was that movie again what was that scene maybe you know so i make a like a picture board of of of, of stuff and then that's one of the things that you can present to a director and say what do you think about that again you can say this is total bullshit. take it away fine but at least you're bringing something to the dark. You're not just there, like without any anything to offer. You know. So for me, I like to take pictures or, or references uh, of of things that I like. Um, put them aside when I read a script. I you know go around and look at it, and and you know once you understand what genre of storytelling it is, is it a horror? Is it a blah blah blah? And then you can put all those pictures together, and you have a a board that you can look at a mood board some directors already come with the mood board um Bithy, who i worked with for like five years now six years is very good at making those kind of things so by the way he yeah. wants to know how wonderful you think it is to work with him just in case you were wondering if he was wondering that? about that <laughs> Bithy was wondering how wonderful it is how wonderful you think it is that you work together you know um so when i was in the states uh, I had I thought I had it figured out, like you know what I was going to do and and stuff like that. And then I had met Mithi before when I was working on another project with Wanuri, and um, uh, of course I knew about just a band and all of them, and I wanted to work with them, but we never did that. And it was the first time we met was on Wanuri set, and I was already like, oh my god, this is Mithi and you know just a band and everything. See, now and he's then, to talk to him now. Now there's no <laughs> is he listening? <laughs> yes, he <says>, no. no <laughs> okay. So yeah, and then and then um, and then the one fine day thing happened, and 
uh, where he wrote a script with Mugambi and I wanted to, I was like, this is a perfect opportunity for me to, because I was, I, at the time I was already thinking of coming back and everything worked out and he and I got to work on Kati Kati. And um, yes, it's been one of the best decisions I've ever made in my life to come back and, and to work on that film. It's the Sounds one that like actually to me. What's that? Sounds like a bromance. Yes, it is actually a bromance. I think we talk, we talk I w not every day, but we talk a lot. Like it's not, he's, you know, he's one of those people who inspire me. Um, I have learned so much about him, uh, about the way he tells stories. It's made me a better filmmaker, a better storyteller. And yes, it's it's one of those. And, and because of that film, Kati Kati, um, he and I work a lot, like it's, it's incredible. I mean, I wouldn't be where I am without him. And, uh, and if he calls me to shoot whatever, anywhere, any place, anytime for free or whatever, I will be there with my team a hundred percent because he's the guy who made me like decide. Well, of course I, for many other reasons, but like, okay, this is, this is worth it. This is what's. And and we still have a lot to do together, you know. That's but really he's yeah, but his his work is incredible. His vision is incredible. Um, last year was a horrible year for everybody else, but for me it was amazing because uh, got to work with uh, one of my favorite bands, Audi Soul, uh, to shoot the music video um, Extravaganza, which BC directed, and then to shoot the album virtual launch for the Midnight Train, Twelve Days of pure niceness and just the other day to shoot another you know and what what these music videos have done is elevated the storytelling capabilities of 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 of, of us here because you know they used to get sorry to say this i hope he's not listening they used to get other people to come and shoot these music videos from south africa and nigeria and things but we've managed to to, to say hey look this can be done here at very low budgets, by the way, but the work is outstanding. The energy is outstanding. And and for me, that feels very, very, it's like the beginning of something, you know, like when the nucleus of something great is coming, that has been, uh, an, uh, yeah, so Mbithi, wherever you are, if you're listening, yeah, you're that guy. Mbithi, you can pay me later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, on that very lovely note, um, I want to talk about I want to talk about inspiration and how that then feeds into your work. You did touch on that a little bit, but to both of you, what who inspires you? What inspires you? And how does that then translate into the work? I know that we say that copying is the highest form of flattery, but really, how does the work that the people whose work you respect and who you look at then translate into how it is you push yourself in your work. Okay, will you um, go first? Um, well, I, I get I get inspired by um, by, by lots of people. It's it's never really one um, artist or one, um, but sometimes really it's a. Um, is somebody who inspires me um, because of the way, uh, because of their work ethic, for example. Others inspire me because of their consistency. Others inspire me by uh, the way they uh, remain uh, young in their heads uh, while they're shooting films at 85 years old. And so it really is, a, it's, a, it's a lot of people. But one of my favorite um, cinematographer and director who recently died, uh, this uh, Englishman called Nicholas Roy. He made a film called Walkabout in Australia and uh, Eureka, an absolutely insane film. That was uh, um, kind of, uh, uh, I think, I think uh, rejected by the studio that had hired him to direct, to shoot it and direct it. And uh, so Nicholas Roy, for example, is the kind of director who uh, also made Don't Look Now. Um, a, a small horror film that, that was amazing. So I get inspired by him. I get inspired by um, by women um, like uh, Caroline Champetier from France, 
and then I get inspired by this um, Ethiopian man who has a particular way of uh, of fil filming the desert. His name is Abraham Haile Biru. He made a film, he shot a film called Darat uh, with uh, uh, Muhammad Saleh Harun, and then he disappeared, they can't find him, yeah. But the way he films the sand and, and the sun and and and, mm -hmm. uh, and and the bodies, uh, the slim bodies of uh, of the Sahel, and uh, it just yeah, it's I'd never seen uh, something that powerful. And then I kept uh, trying to find his work, and I can't find it, unfortunately. And so he really, he, and sometimes I get inspired by, um, for example, Hergé, uh, who uh, who drew uh, uh, who, the creator of, of Tintin, for example, the way he draws uh, the action or the way. Yeah, so he, he comes from different uh, places, and then lots of photographers, uh, lots of, uh, um, uh, and and sometimes the, uh, I come across a, uh, a piece of literature. Uh, that's uh, that's so uh, uh, visual in the way it's written, and then uh, um, and then it creates um, like it causes this flood of images in my head, and then uh, yeah. So because again, uh, film um, is uh, is at the crossroads of so many uh, art forms, and then sometimes it's uh, the way people move without even being filmed. Like uh, they, I, I know this guy, the way he walks in Kigali. And then uh, I just, yeah, he has just this uh, way he carries his, uh, um, his very bony body. Uh, like, and then he inspires me. And then I'm like, how can you film that? You can't film that the way you film uh, everybody else. And then, uh, yeah, so I, it, it really sometimes individuals have got absolutely nothing to do with film or people who haven't got uh, anything to do with, uh, with images. Uh, it's, it's basically remaining. Um, uh, Open. I mean, being open-minded, and then uh, and um, uh, uh, making sure that I never become uh, rigid uh, with anything, and, and then allowing myself to uh, to uh, to marvel at, at things, and then uh, and then having these um, reflexes of a um, of a of a content creator. I mean, screenshotting everything that passes through my. Uh, uh, my monitor, and sometimes I get inspired by YouTube, by these new. Uh, um, uh, do you know Jackass? I do uh, not. They, they created this trend of uh, uh, of uh, uh, putting your body at test, and then uh, just like eating horse manure, and then all. I do time. know it. I well, do you, know it. I do disgusting. Know it. Yeah, it's disgusting, but because they they really pioneered a, 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 a way of filming um, uh, a sort of reality TV. And then some of their shots, uh, you look at them now, and then like, okay, that was interesting. And then they've been copied and copied and copied by these um, uh, you, YouTubers who are uh, like uh, trying new things. I mean, uh, uh, running across, uh, I, I don't know, the uh, like, like in the polar region, uh, naked, and then and, and then so I mean, all these all these things. I mean, uh, there's always a moment of this, and there's always a moment of poetry. You have interest, and then uh, and then sometimes I find myself downloading these things and then creating uh, folders, uh, very organized folders, as as Drew said, uh, where I have uh, uh, like uh, uh, visuals, text, um, like um, and then those visuals could be a uh, photographic, uh, a clip from something, it could be uh, a, a poster from uh, uh, like this uh, Soviet era of uh, uh, of Czechoslovakia. Or it can be uh, a statue that I saw, and that was kind of uh, that had like shapes uh, that I quite liked. It can be any and everything, really. It's uh, it's being uh, um, very um, uh, open to the world, and uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I told you earlier about my the reason why I became a, a cinematographer is because of this incident at twelve. But actually, it started earlier than that because my dad was a very intellectual guy. Uh, he grew up in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and he had this amazing collection of pictures. It, it's, you know, black and white photographs from, from back in, you know, when he was in school, in high school, and things like that. And so we had several albums, like just, you know, so when I'm growing up, I'm looking at these pictures, and they are froze, and my mom in miniskirts, now she's 76, if I show her a picture of her in miniskirts, and, and you know, the, I was like, you know, it, it fascinated me. I still go back to those images. I still have those pictures, and I'm like, 
that's that to me inspires me because you can see the poses and the dressings and the platforms and the things and i'm like i wish i was i was living in that era and and one of my inspirations is actually storytelling from that side especially for for africans because we were just coming from that transition period from colonialism to 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 being independent republics and and there was so much story then which i feel like we haven't explored and for me i think i like that era of 50s 60s 70s you know and the music and the it yeah. seems such a such a vivacious lifestyle back then you know there was a lot of yeah yeah so for me that's my main source of like and 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 cutting it back to like for example like saudi soul like extravaganza you know for them with their dresses and you know hits back to those times you know franco lombo lombo macchiadi my dad still has we still have those uh, lps of of franco and bob mali and 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 you know all the ska music from from the 70s and stuff and there was rebellion and freedom and that to me inspires me that's my i live in that world yeah you you mentioned uh bollywood films at some point or, or yeah, yeah that's oh what i'm God. saying my, my dad my dad had but he had the vhs tapes of ramayan the whole damn thing man we okay. were watching ramayan and and uh and uh, what's the other one the mahabharat, mahabharat. You know? yes it was he was this guy who i think that's why i mean this business because it started from then when we were we were kids and he would read yeah. he, he would he read newspaper sorry Do you know and noon with amita bachan and uh, hema malini yes 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 you know so, so uh, yeah. Or, yeah. Or, yeah. i mean the kind of um i watched it i watch them now as an adult because i used yeah. to consume I used to watch lots of them uh, back in the days and then they kind of uh, um uh, they were the first steps towards my film literacy uh yeah. because that's how I knew uh, how to predict what's going to happen not because they were poorly yeah. written but because yeah. I mean you I get, get, get trained and then your uh your storytelling uh, yeah the way you understand storytelling and the, the three yeah. abstract yeah and then yeah. how um uh maybe all these uh, mad effects that they had to show you who's the the bad guy and then uh, the yeah. situation right and then uh, and then the texture because it created um a sort of a, like nostalgic feel and then uh, years later uh, when i started creating images myself i was obviously using digital tools and then uh, but there's this uh, like nostalgia that I developed of uh, of uh, images and then uh, and then it comes straight from uh, uh, the bollywood of, of those yeah of, of yeah. my child and uh, yeah, yeah. So, and and so i go back to them now and i watch them and then uh, and then and then i find myself uh, kind of like having these screenshots and then uh, putting them in my folders wow. and yeah and i find myself kind of uh, uh, like taking these snaps and snaps and snaps and and i have lots of them yeah so i get inspired by them as well Yeah. That then brings to a question of style. And as a filmmaker, someone asked as a filmmaker, do you feel you have a particular style of storytelling and does it even matter to have one? Or does it just happen if you just I mean I think every project I think every happen. project I it for yeah. me I I don't think I have a well, I've been told I have a style and the style is I'm really good at shooting handheld. And that comes from my news and documentary stage mm -hmm. right uh i just feel natural with my the camera on my shoulder and stuff like that i'm very stable and ta -da 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 because you know you had to run chase people and stuff like that stuff like that it, which i don't think about it because it's in you know but apparently it shows itself on in my images i don't like a very stiff camera like on a tripod and things unless the story calls for it it's always like you know has this kind of movement in there um but i think every project is different i mean it depends with the characters and the story and then the style comes after i think for me at least um even though sometimes you may put something in there that you may not know that it's there but i think every project should have its own um for me i think the style that i have is naturalism using natural light as much as possible and being as simple as you can and sometimes we you go somewhere and you switch off the lights because it's too much you know 
Um, and then that lighting is one other thing that I'm still, you know, 10 years later, I'm still working on it. It's a work in progress. I haven't perfected it to be a master of, of lighting, but as simple as, uh, as possible. One source, sometimes no feel. Maybe that's a style that I like. I like things going dark, especially. I'm not afraid of, sometimes, you know, people want to put so much light to see everything. I'm like, that's ridiculous. So that's not how natural light works, you know. Right. Um, well, wonderful conversation, guys. We have about 10 minutes left, less now, actually. So okay. if anyone has any questions, please put them in now and we'll try and squeeze them in. Um, for some reference material for Drew's and Kivu's inspirations and some of their work, please have a look at the links that we will provide in the description below after. Sorry, Kivu, I interrupted you. Uh, you did? Um, I think I did. I may yeah. have. I'm very good at that. Yeah. What was I saying? I don't remember. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Damn it. Um, it we were we were talking about inspiration, but I can ask another question that might jog your memory. Mm -hmm. uh, I really want to know what it is that you both do in your down uh, downtime to to sharpen, you know, your skill set to hone the skills more. What do you do? What do you consume? What do you think about? Is it just a question of more practice? But I suspect that there's more. No. Um. I used to be a bulimic uh, film um, viewer. Uh, I don't know what happened, but I watched lots of YouTube uh, because that's the museum of humanity. Like everything is there. Like I try something for my childhood. Uh, something that was uh, uh, filmed by an unknown camera person, and then bam, it's there. And then, uh, and I find. Um, um, uh, and, and I find so many new ways of using light or, or, or filming uh, or using um, uh, or using uh, production design or, or, or using um, uh, like old kind of uh, um, like decommissioned tools. And then so I, I, I'm, uh, I'm very passionate about YouTube at the moment. And uh, when when I don't feel like putting in extra effort, extra intellectual effort, but you always end up um, uh, putting extra intellectual effort into everything, unfortunately. Uh, so I just like put YouTube there, and then uh, I let uh, sometimes the, the algorithms uh, lead me to um, uh, to two kids in, uh, uh, in Sri Lanka, uh, kind of uh, like showing how you make uh, uh, palm wine, uh, like their own version of palm wine. And then sometimes it's uh, like, okay, I've never thought that you could film uh, like this process this way, uh, because they're using uh, uh, equipment that I don't necessarily use, and then uh, they don't um, sometimes suffer the, uh, the, the, yeah, the burden of having gone through uh, uh, like this heavy workshop or formal training that makes you uh, think that this is how you do it. And then, uh, uh, and then there, there are all these different angles different um, ways of uh, moving the cameras and then uh, yeah so I watch lots of YouTube and uh, and uh, uh, sometimes in languages that I don't understand and then I get uh, I get lots of uh, um, I get I get lots of inspiration from it and I, and I get sometimes um, I have found myself uh, like watching for example uh, like lots of cockfights for example I know they're like they're unethical but cockfights in, in, Tha in Thailand. <laughs> Because sometimes uh, I mean, we're talking about a lot of the action happening at ground level, and then you have uh, um, a lot of adults uh, maybe doing it in a, in a clandestine ways and, and, and uh, in, uh, in, a, in dark areas, and then the way they use the light because they want the lights to heat the the, uh, the, the coat. It's just it's I mean, all these uh, becomes quite fascinating, and then uh, uh, and and I consume lo lots of that. And and uh, it has taught me to. Uh, uh, it, it teaches me how to uh, uh, keep trying to innovate with the tools. And because I'm very privileged to, to own some gear, some equipment, so I film a lot nowadays. I'm, I, I make my mission to film um, like every 
every time I get and uh, every time I have uh, free time in my hands and and I'm out there, I'm in the garden. There's a wind or there's a uh, there's a bug in the garden or there's a, or I have friends over having drinks or uh, I try to film uh, all the time the same way a writer should be uh, uh, should try to write uh, a few lines every week or a uh, kind of train their voice um, uh, to pay feet and then yeah so I film a lot nowadays uh, I don't film with my phone anymore at some point I was fascinated with with that but I got um, I lost uh, interest. And now I film with a uh, um, uh, with some like regular cameras, um, on, uh, almost on a daily basis. I film something. Okay, true. Uh, for me, I'm an avid reader. I like to read stuff. So because that's does something to my brain. You know, you the way people write, they're very descriptive, and then I create images in my head. I'm terrible at sketching and drawing. So, but all the images are there. So I like to read stuff um, about things that I, you know, architecture or music or, you know, stuff like that. Um, YouTube is a great uh, place to get, especially now with, with technology, to see camera tests and things like that, you know, things you don't have access to, uh, different uh, technologies that are coming up for, for how to do things, because sometimes, you know, especially with COVID, you don't, uh, I sat, for three months without touching it, like equipment and whatever, working on it, you know, like, so take your phone, take your camera, take a picture, go there and work on your color correction and things like that, you know, um, just to keep your mind, mind working and, and things like that. So, and the other stuff I'm doing is, doesn't have anything to do with cinematography, which kind of balances the brain out. It's you're out there in the farm doing whatever, you know, and then when you come back to it, you feel fresh and, and I exercise and cycle and keep keep fit because part of my job is to carry all this heavy equipment and run up and down and you have to be physically physically fit, mentally and physically. So those are some of the things that I do to just, you know. Yeah, but yeah. then all the stuff that you do that seemingly has nothing to do with, with the work feeds the work. Oh. Of course, it feeds the work because you're always thinking about it. Because all those things are there, like okay, the light is there. This person is saying this thing, you know, ta da da. You know, like you're you're observing people all the time because that's what you do. You're okay. you're listening, you're watching faces, you're seeing. Okay, you know, you're reading people's emotions because that's what a cinematographer does. It's like okay, you know, you're always your mind is working. You may think it doesn't have to do anything with cinematography or storytelling, but it's always working. Yeah. Yeah. Final question. Uh, Drew made an earlier comment about not having seen his grandmother's stories visually realized in film. What visuals and narratives do you still hope to put out in the world? Budget, not a concern. Um, for me, I think the colonialism is a very big part of my family, uh, land issues. Um, my grandparents were living in Nyari here, which was a, it's a high-end estate in, in, in Nairobi. And it was, a, it was a coffee farm. And my mother was born there in 1946. And my father was born on the other side of the hill and he, he lost his older brothers due to the Mau Mau fight between colonialism and ta -da -da. so and, and that those stories still affect us until today we still have land issues because of of colonialism so for me if there's a story that i would want to do is about um access to land or lack of and where all these issues came from and because i think that's a big part of this problem we have in in, in kenya per se is what happened you know go behind the scenes and, and discover it. And I got an opportunity to do that uh, when I came back. Um, I don't know if I'm supposed to talk about it here, but we've been working on a, on a Mau Mau documentary with, uh, with my very good friend Zippy for the last four years and it's finished and, and, and it's, my gosh, it's, it's, it's something, it's a big deal. It's gonna be a big deal, you know, because that's what we're talking about. You know, it's it's in, and 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 then it goes ties back to my um, my news days. You know, 
some of the ways we had to do it was you know clandestine and things like that but it's a very important story and it hits in the the why we call kenya who called us kenya and why we kenya mm. and who's a kenya it goes back to the basics of who we are as a country mm. and some of the problems that we're facing until now and the reasons why the, the the images that my grandmother was painting for me are not there why is that because of our education system why is that you know you start asking those questions and they kind of all from a, it's a microcosm, but there's a, this huge thing over there, you know? So for me, that's, if I had all the money in the world, that's what I would be making. Ivo, same question. Um, well, my, my grandmother used to, <laughs> to uh, uh, she could have been a, an amazing stand-up comedian. So it was, uh, yeah, so that's, that's uh, uh, she's my sister now, so she's no longer with us. Uh, yeah, so the the films, there are so many films I'd like uh, and I hope to make. And um, some of them, um, uh, one of them, there's one that uh, sort of, uh, uh, that keeps coming back to my mind now, is um, it's the story of uh, um, uh, these uh, East African uh, traditional um, chiefs uh who uh, um find themselves um uh, uh their land being uh, the um uh the battlefield between um a small german contingent uh, some small german units and then uh, english units or belgian units in the case of rwanda in 1916 when the germans were uh, losing the war um because all of a sudden you have these uh, two uh, groups of uh, uh, white people who look exactly the same. I mean, they have uh, 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 they have uniforms that look slightly different, but they both carry these guns that make similar noises. And then uh, they, uh, they have uh, uh, comparable levels of greed uh, and, 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 of, uh, and they commit um, uh, atrocities that um, like make you see them as a, as as a whole, and then all of a sudden they start. Um, you find these two groups fighting uh, uh, in like on your, on your traditional land, and uh, um, I wonder. I mean, how did those uh, uh, traditional leaders? I mean, how were they uh, analyzing and, and trying to understand the situation and make sense of it and and uh, explain it to their um, uh, to the populations that they were uh, that were under their uh, uh, their uh, spiritual and political um, uh, responsibilities, and uh, how was it to be a, 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 a political chief of a small village and seeing a, a, a small group of uh, fifty uh, Germans and 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 fifty and and two hundred or one hundred and fifty Belgians and coming in and and shooting themselves uh, to death in yeah. They, uh, how did they understand uh, the bigger picture, what was happening uh, back then, and wh how did they make sense of this? I've always wanted to make that kind of war film, like something set in 1960, uh, 1916, uh, either in Rwanda or Tanzania, like large savannas, and then uh, one small ch uh, chief who used to see uh, um, recruiters coming to ask him, uh, asking for his youngest uh, and, and, and fetus, uh, boys to go and fight for uh, the Englishmen, and then all of a sudden seeing uh, like a group of Germans coming, and yes, yeah, it must have been so confusing, I think. And then, and I wish I could, uh, um, yeah, I wish, I wish I could make a film uh, around that issue of uh, like World War One uh, in East Africa. I like that. I like that. I like both. Um, and on that note, thank you both so much for your time and your generosity. This talk has been enlightening, heartening, inspiring. Thank you both so much. Thank you all very much for tuning in. Um, if you have any thoughts, anything else, I suppose if you put them in the comments, let's see what we can do about them. If you're curious about anything else, I mean, we have other talks planned. Um, we will be releasing them as and when. Stay tuned on, on Manyata Screening Socials to see. And also anyone who is interested in show, having their film shown on Manyata Screenings, our next call for submissions comes out in April. So look out for that. Thank you all so much. Good evening.
Thank you, guys. Thank you.